Go ahead and get started. Good morning. Hey, good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, we have just a few announcements that we want to make uh, as we begin. And uh, Kevin, why don't you go ahead and talk about the Christmas musical that's coming up, or cantata. All right. Well, we are having a Christmas musical coming up. Um, it's going to be on the 18th. That's in two weeks. So it's going to be at 6 o'clock, and we're going to be, the adults are going to be singing. We also have a, some of the kids that are going to be joining us for a couple of the songs. So I think it'll be a really good time of just celebrating Christmas and the true meaning of Christmas, the birth of Jesus. Um, we're also going to have a, a hot chocolate fellowship afterwards in the Family Life Center that's always real good. So hopefully y'all will be able to come. That's in two weeks, the 18th at 6 o'clock. All right. Thank you, Kevin. I um, also want to remind everyone that this year, as we do every year, we have a Christmas Eve service. I also recognize that many of you will be with families and that sort of thing, and you may not be able to come, but I encourage you to bring your family, if you can, to be a part of that uh, wonderful evening together. It's a candlelit service. But um, what I want you to know is this year we're doing it a little bit different. We're going to start around 4.30. And uh, I want to read something to you to kind of give you a description of what to expect. Picture walking up to the entrance of the church, being met by Bethlehem shepherds, talking about the events of the evening and the unusual star that is shining over the church. Stop and pet their sheep or Joseph's donkey, stabled outside the entrance. All of this is going to happen at 4.30 Walk inside and taste some of the food items that Joseph and Mary would have brought on their journey and hear about what their journey would have been like over 2,000 years ago. Visit the indoor manger scene, then come into the sanctuary for a traditional Christmas Eve service that includes the children's Christmas story and communion. Our service will begin at 4.30. It will be over by 6 o'clock that afternoon. So I hope that you can come and be a part of that event that will be coming up on Christmas Eve. And uh, on Christmas Day, which is on Sunday this year, we're going to meet for one service at 1030 over in the Family Life Center. We'll have coffee, cocoa, donuts, and that kind of stuff on Christmas morning. So make plans for that. We would love to have you come out and be a part of that. All right. Are there any other announcements that I need to make? I think that has got it covered. There is one more thing I'd like to do. Gerald and Elaine, so glad that you could come and join us this morning. Would you stand up for just a moment? Our folks can see you. All of you know, amen. All of you know Gerald and Elaine quite well. Um, this will be the second time they've left us. <laughs> they left and moved away, and then they came back, and they've been serving faithfully ever since. And Gerald and Elaine is moving away again. And actually, they have already moved, but they agreed to come. And uh, right after service today, we're going to have a reception for the two of them uh, just uh, so that we can fellowship with them and just say our goodbyes uh, the great thing is, is that they're not that far away, so Gerald says he'll be here about every other week anyway, right? <laughs> uh, no, but they will be able to come back and be with us. We also wanted to do something else special, and the funny thing about it is, is all of these folks are related in some way, uh, but uh, we have here as well Bessie Woodall, and Miss Bessie, is it possible for you just to stand right where you are? Can you do that? Y'all know Miss Bessie has not been well. Amen. <laughs> Miss Bessie has been a joy to work with. She is our. She has been our church secretary since I've been here. As a matter of fact, she has been the church secretary now for over twenty years. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and this morning. We wanted to give her some flowers and also a plaque that just simply says, Bessie Woodall, thank you for your service to our Lord at First Baptist Church of Jewett, December 4th, 2022. And now abide in faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love, 1 Corinthians 13. 
All the time I've known Miss Betsy, and as she served, she has exemplified the love of Christ. So I wanted to give her this plaque as well, and we're going to go to where she is. By the way, the reception is also to honor Miss Bessie as well, so we'll have time to personally thank her for her 20 years of serving along with us here at First Baptist. Hey, good to see everybody this morning. Would you stand at this time, turn to someone, and greet them as we continue? to your seats. We'll sing through this chorus one more time. Let's sing together higher than the sky. Higher than the sky, your love, your love is deeper than the sea. Your grace, your grace is washing over me and calling me your own, your own. Just before we pray, there's a video I'd like to share with you. This is You can have a seat for just a moment. This is a time of year that we collect our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We have set our goal at $3,000 this year. And I want to share a video with you about that offering. So let's do that right now. That's not the video, the Lottie Moon video. points on a map. They aren't just places to us. We see stories of lives living without the hope found in Jesus. Today, somewhere between the Great Commission and the Great Multitude, we find ourselves facing the world's greatest problem, lostness. Even in the midst of natural disasters, humanitarian crises, and political instability, 
Southern Baptists send IMB missionaries to give their lives to the lost, living amongst those who have never heard the gospel. People in hard to reach places, people in cities, and those who are dispersed and displaced around the world. At the IMB, we believe that missionary presence cultivates gospel access. Gospel access that knows no geographic or social boundary. We believe that missionary presence fuels gospel belief, and we see the results. We see lives transformed, generations forever changed, and churches planted. Local expressions of the church that take ownership and thrive. God has made our purpose clear. Together, we seek to take the gospel to every nation, to all tribes, to all peoples, to all languages. We don't see places on a map. We see our place in fulfilling the Great Commission. This is our mission. This is your mission. And we are reaching the nations together. In the pew or on the pew, you'll find an envelope that looks something like this. I'll encourage you to use that for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering this year. If you didn't come prepared to give today, we're going to be doing this for the next three or four weeks. So you have time to pray about that. But you can go ahead and get an envelope. Keep that with you as a reminder to pray for our International Mission Board, our missionaries. 100% of everything that's collected to go uh, in the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes to foreign missions. So you pray about that over the next few weeks as you give. Let's pray together and we'll continue our service. Father, we thank you so much for the day. Thank you for all your blessings, God. And Lord, as you have blessed us, Lord, we want to be a blessing, Lord, to the nations. And I pray, God, that you would just lay it upon the heart of every person here, that, God, that they might give according to, Lord, to your direction and your guidance, I pray, Father, that you would help us to meet our goal of $3,000 and even exceed that, Lord. That, Lord, the gospel might go forward. That, Lord, the nations might hear, Lord, the good news of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I, I pray today that you would be with our services, Lord. You know the heart of every person that is here today. And, Lord, those who will be listening online we pray, God, that you would work in our hearts, God. Speak to us today. Give us a fresh word of heaven, Lord, as we enter into the Christmas season, Lord. I pray that, Lord, we would be the light that you've called us to be in a dark place. And, God, we we'll just praise you for all that you do in this service this morning. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen and amen.
We began the season of Advent last week with the lighting of the first purple candle that represented hope. The second candle represents peace and reminds us of the peace we have in Christ, who made possible his birth in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. The prophet Micah foretold of Christ's birthplace in Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing like showers that water the earth. In his days, the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace until the moon is no more.
Thank you, Kevin. Some of you may have seen these when you came in near the, uh, the bulletins when you came in. If you didn't, there's still some out there. I saw quite a few. These are bookmarks, and you're probably wondering what the bookmark is all about. Well, we have been in the book of Mark now. <laughs> bookmark. We've been in the book of Mark for um, about, I say, 13 or 14 weeks, and we have made it all the way to chapter 4. Uh, so we still have a ways to go. But in the month of December, I'm going to be preaching a series of Christmas messages. And then in the uh, month of January, we're going to turn our attention towards stewardship as we begin the new year. And as you will see on the bookmark, on February the 5th, we will return to the book of Mark. So take your bookmark and place it in your Bible at Mark chapter 4. And that's where we will pick up in the book of February, in the month of February. Uh, um, I would encourage you, though, during this time, this little sabbatical on the book of Mark, that you take time to read the rest of the book. So uh, pick up where we left off, read through it. And by the way, if you have any questions, if you jot them down on a note, then I can try to incorporate that into some of my messages as we deal uh, with those passages of Scripture. But for today, I want you to turn your attention to the book of Galatians, the book of Galatians chapter 4. The book of Galatians chapter 4. Now, I have preached quite a few messages out of the book of Galatians, including the text that we're looking at today. For whatever reason, uh, God would not let me uh, move on from this passage, but this was the passage that I felt like that we needed to cover this morning. And it's not a passage when you read it and you, you think, oh, that's Christmas. But I think you will see that this is probably one of the greatest Christmas passages in all the Bible. So we're going to take time to look at it this morning. Well, let me ask you as we begin, are you ready for Christmas? Oh, no. <laughs> Get ready, it's coming. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, I, it's funny, I can remember the years where Marsha and I would go out on Christmas Eve and load the car down with all the gifts and to bring home for Christmas time, you know. And uh, now I find this on Amazon and our phone <laughs> doing the same thing. Uh, man, things have changed through the years in the way we shop, the way we do the gifts and all of that. But, um, you know, there is, there's a lot of shopping that is going on, sales, traffic, uh, putting up the tree or trees, as many of you have multiple trees, hanging the socks from the mantle and filling it with God knows what. Uh, we buy presents and we send out cards. Uh, someone said we cook more than we eat. We eat more than we can digest and we spend more on presents that no one will even remember in two months. And I think that's a good description for a lot of folks as to how Christmas looks. Uh, we want our children to be good or else the overweight man who's going to break into the home will eat their cookies and will leave them overpriced toys they've been begging for for 10 months, right? Uh, that's kind of a description of the modern day, modern day Christmas. Well, I hope that that's not the case for you. I hope that in your home that you genuinely celebrate the true meaning of Christmas. And I believe that most of you probably do. But Christmas is a time of giving, and we know that as we give, that God gave us the greatest gift to all of mankind, and that being the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Christmas is a wonderful time of year, especially for the Christian. You know, for over 2,000 years, there have been men who have tried to do away with Christianity. To be quite honest with you, there are people today that would just assume that Christianity and all that represent it would just fall off the face of the earth and never return. That's the reality. But you know what the good news is? Is that as we celebrate Christmas here, there will people be people literally all around the world doing what? Celebrating Christmas. That is the birth 
of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as hard as Satan may try, the Christmas message still carries on. And it will carry on through this year's as well. Hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, the prophets foretold with precise accuracy about how he would come. How the Messiah would come. When Paul the Apostle wrote this letter to the Galatian church, I'm sure he had no idea as to what Christmas would look like for you and I today. But as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, he wrote the message that God gave him, a timeless message that is very relevant to you and I today. So this morning in Galatians 4, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, which are going to be our focal points to today's message, Paul gives us the meaning of Christmas in these two verses. I believe that these two verses clarify the true meaning of what Christmas is all about. So with that said, let's stand as we look together at Galatians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 7 and then focus on 4 and 5. Paul wrote to the Galatian church, Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons... God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that you'd bless the preaching of your word today. God, I know that as we gather here this morning, Lord, that there is, with all probability, someone, who has never really understood the Christmas message. Lord, someone who has never repented of their sin and asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and their Savior. I pray through the preaching, through the message, through the power of your Holy Spirit that you'd speak to them today. God, they might come to Christ. And Lord, um, I pray that as we explore the Christmas message, Lord, that this message would be one of hope for all who are here today. God, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts, and God will praise you for it. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, what can we learn from this passage of Scripture this morning? I want you to notice with me, if you will, the supreme strategy of God. The supreme strategy of God. The strategy of the Lord. The interesting thing is, is that as I prepared this message, I didn't realize that in Sunday school we were going to be dealing with John 1. But John 1 deals with some of the things that we're going to be looking at this morning. But we see in this passage, if you will, the supreme strategy of God. Notice that God, not man, controls history. God, not man, controls history. Verse 4 says, but when the fullness of time had come. You see, Jesus being born was not just an arbitrary happening. In other words, God didn't look down on the earth and he, and he didn't j- just suddenly say, you know what, the world is messed up, I need to save it, and I'm going to send my son to the world, and uh, I, this looks like a good time that I'm going to send him to the world. That did not happen. That was not the way that it worked. No, it was in God's plan from the beginnings of the world before you were ever even a thought, the plan of salvation and when he would send his son to, into this world. So it was the plan of God that would send Jesus at the right time. The Paul, Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatian church these words again. He said, but when the fullness of the time had come when the fullness of the time had come it was a time that God predetermined before the creation of the world 
I still remember Marsha and I, uh, when we had our three children, we had different doctors and, and uh, we were in Lama's classes and all of that. And, you know, everybody's trying to pinpoint exactly when the child will be born and even uh, trying to determine what sex the child might be. Well, you know, one thing I discovered after we had all three of our children, for the most part, they were wrong. They didn't get the, the sex of the child right. They didn't even get the date right. I mean, our first child, how many weeks was she overdue? Three weeks overdue. They didn't get it right. But what I want you to know is, is that God predetermined the time and he sent Jesus at the right time. He sent Jesus at the perfect time. He had a time pre-appointed before the world was ever created to when Jesus would be born into the world. Someone, he said, said he set the date of the first Christmas before the first day of history, and when time had been filled up to that date, Jesus the Savior was born. That is when Christ was born into the world. Now notice the timing of God. I want you to note that it was the perfect time for Jesus to come. What made it so perfect? Well, it was during the time that Roman ruled the world. It was the Pax Romana, the, when there was relatively peace on earth. Now, it was forced peace by the Romans. They were oppressors, but it was a time of relative peace. And Rome ruled the world, the, the civilized world, for at least 200 years. But the Romans demanded allegiance. This was the, the time that God sent Jesus into the world. They built roads, that is the Romans, from city to city that was imported for trade and for commerce. There was one currency, and more importantly, there was one predominant language. That is, everyone knew Greek and had learned Greek, the Greek language. So all of this come together at the right time. And the Apostle Paul and others would travel the roads that the Romans built, and what would they do? They would preach the gospel, and they could speak Greek where Greek was needed because they knew that the people understood Greek. I tell you, it was no arbitrary time when God sent Jesus into the world. He sent Jesus into the world at the absolute perfect time so that people could understand the message of God that was being carried to them. So we see the timing. You see, the entire New Testament would have been written in the common language of Greek that almost everyone could have read for themselves. It was a unifying language, and it made it easy to carry the gospel to the world. The Jewish people, for the most part, had been able to leave captivity and return to Jerusalem. It was during this time when the temple had been rebuilt and people were unified around the temple. It was during that time. They looked forward to the coming Messiah. They were looking forward to it. It was being taught. People were hoping against hope that the Messiah would come. And you know, for some of us, as we look around our world, and even in our nation, as we see everything that's going on, I mean, our prayer is what? Come, Lord Jesus. Because we know that He is our only hope. So we long for the day that Christ will come. It was no different for them. They longed for the day that the Messiah would come. And I tell you, He came at the perfect time. The Jews prayed this prayer every day, and they still pray this prayer. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah. Even though he tarries, I will wait for him every coming day. Friend, that ought to be your prayer every day. Come, Lord Jesus. Come today. He, they longed for the Lord Jesus to come. Every Jewish woman wondered if she would be the carrier of the Messiah, the deliverer of Israel. They had no idea, and they looked at it in a very fleshly sense, not in the sense that we'll be examining this morning, but they longed for the day the Messiah would come. They hoped and prayed that maybe they would be the carrier of the Messiah. 
mother of the king who would deliver God's people from the Roman oppression. But God had a plan that he would come into the world at the right time. I don't know where you are in life, but let me just say to you this morning that God is never late. He knows you, and he knows what's going on in your life here this morning. And I promise you, at the right time, God will reveal himself to you. I don't matter what you're going through. You can count on God because he's never late. Amen? We can count on him. Secondly, this morning, we see the miraculous process of God. Notice the person it involves. Who sent his son? God did. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. God sent forth his son. We know that over in the Gospel of John, as we studied in Sunday school this morning, that God sent forth the Logos, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? Was God. And then it goes on and it says, and the Word became flesh. That's who God sent. He sent Jesus into the world, the the Logos, into the world. So God sent forth his son. You see, Christmas is about the birth of the son of God. Let us not forget that. Let us never fail to emphasize that at Christmas, that Christmas is about the son of God. Who did God send? He sent his son into the world. It was not Joseph's son, the husband-to-be of Mary, No, that was not his son. It was God's son who came into the world. He was the son of the highest, the offspring of the Almighty, God in the flesh, as we just referenced. In theological terms, he was the incarnation. God clothed himself in flesh. He was born a Jew. He was born poor in a poor family, but... On the eighth day after his birth, he was circumcised just like every other Jewish boy. But he belonged to his Father in heaven, God. That's who Jesus was. Notice the miracle involved. He came from God. And now, down through history, we've had those, and especially in recent history, who have said that scientifically, a virgin cannot have a child Our text says this, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. And other text tells us that she would have been a virgin. In other words, she had never had a child. She had never been with another man. But she conceived as a virgin her son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came into the world born of a virgin. Now, it's not humanly possible for a woman who is a virgin to get pregnant and have a child, is it? No, it's still not possible for that to take place today. But that is why after the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she would conceive in her womb and bring forth a son, that he also said, for with God, what, nothing is possible. For, for with God, nothing will be impossible. He stated that to Mary. And folks... God is saying to you, and he says to me today, with God, nothing is impossible. If he can bring forth a child from a virgin named Mary, then he can handle whatever you're going through this morning. Because you know why? Because the word of God, the precious promise from the word of God, is a promise that we can apply to our own lives as believers today, that nothing is impossible with him. In other words, this is not possible with man But nothing is impossible with God. Truly, Christmas is about a miracle. It's about a miracle that came into the world. The Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he was the pre-existent one. Another theological term. He was a theophany that we read about over in the Old Testament. You will find text in the Old Testament. It says, in the angel of God. And it's a clear reference to the Logos, the Word of God. It's a clear reference, if you will, to the Lord Jesus Christ before he was ever born into the world. That's what we have here on Christmas. We see Christ in Genesis on Mount Moriah on its peak. 
which is believed to be the foundation stone. And we had the opportunity of going up on that mount in, uh, on the uh, Temple Mount. And on the Temple Mount today, if you look at the pictures, you'll see that golden dome there. That's the Muslim mosque. And uh, inside of that mosque, there is a the top of that mountain, that stone, that rock, if you will, that's still there inside of that mosque. But this is what happened on that mount. The angel of the Lord called to him, that is Abraham, and he said to Abraham, this is where this took place, is on that mountain. Do not lay your hand on the lad do, uh, or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. Who spoke that to Abraham? The angel of God, the Logos, the Word of God. Even there he was speaking at that time. This is the pre-existent one. We see him in the burning bush, the angel of the Lord. In Exodus 3, 2, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, that is Moses, in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then it goes on, it says, So when the Lord saw that he turned aside and looked, God called to him from the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. And Abraham responded, Here I am. Here I am. He had an encounter with the preexistent one. That is the Logos, the Word of God. He had an encounter with Christ before Christ ever even came into the world. You see, Jesus Christ came when? When the fullness of time was up, at the right time. You see, he didn't just start being Christ when he was born. He was already Christ before he came into the world. And that's the important thing we need to understand today. And maybe you're here today and you're facing some tough times, bad health, family issues. Let me encourage you this morning that with God, nothing is impossible. Just as God came into the world, God performed a miracle. He came into the world at the right time. Nothing is impossible with God. You see, Christmas is about a miracle. Someone said Christ did not begin to be the Son of God at Bethlehem. Christ did not begin to be the Son of God at the Jordan River when he was baptized. He didn't begin to become the Son of God when he rose from the dead and was seen among many for 40 days. He didn't begin to be the Son of God then. He didn't begin to be the Son of God at the ascension when he ascended back to the Father. No, he was always the Son of God. He was always the Son of God. From eternity past to eternity future, Christ was God in the flesh. Verse 4 again, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. You see, this preexistent Christ he was just as much alive before he was born into the world as he is today, 2,000 years after his death, burial, and resurrection. He's just as much alive today as he was when he rose from the dead. And he wants a relationship with every man, woman, boy, or girl that breathes the air that he created. He wants a relationship with you. That's the miracle of Christmas. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Jesus came. He came when? When the fullness of time had come at the right time. And that brings me to my last point, the redeemable purpose of God. The redeemable purpose of God. The celebration of Christmas is about a miracle, but it's much more than that. Look at verse 5. To redeem those who were under the law that we might have the adoption as sons. At the appointed time, Jesus came, but he came with a purpose. He came for, for a reason, and that was to redeem you, to pay for your sin and to pay for my sin. 
Don't miss this point. If you miss it, you'll miss the main reason for Christmas. As exciting as it is, and we celebrate it all the time, and we've got the, uh, the manger scene set up over here symbolizing what took place. And we think about this little babe in a manger, but remember, he grew up. And for three and a half years, he did miracles here on the earth. And he was an authoritative teacher here on the earth. But the greatest thing that Jesus ever did for you and for me was to die and to rise from the dead. That's why he came. So when we celebrate this miracle at Christmas time, let us not forget why he came. It was to redeem us, to, to buy back. You see, the full meaning was to buy back in order to what? To set us free. What is he setting us free from? From our sin and from all unrighteousness when we come to him. You see, Jesus was sent into the world to buy us out of the slave market and to set us free from bondage. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, when the angel said that Jesus would save his people from their sins, he was referring to to the work of redemption that Paul is talking about here in the book of Galatians. He came to the earth to redeem, to save sinners. That's you. That's me. That should cause us to celebrate, amen? Jesus came into the world and he he died for me. He paid the price for me. He saved me and he saved you. And so we come together at Christmas. Yes, we celebrate that he came at the right time. But folks, he came to redeem me, to buy me back, to pay my sin debt. Many people will spend a lot of money here at Christmas time. Some will buy very expensive gifts to give to the one that they love most. I've read that there are some around our world that will literally spend millions of dollars on diamonds at Christmas to give the people that they love. I read just this last week where a gentleman was sending and has declared that he was sending a $100,000 check to every relative that he had. You might ought to find out if you're kin to him. (laughs) $100,000 to every relative. Wow. You know, there's nothing in this world that could equate with the gift that God gave us in His Son, Jesus. Priceless, priceless gift. The greatest gift that God could have ever given. Listen, God emptied heaven of the very best that He had. And He sent Jesus. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. As we celebrate at Christmas, let's not fail to remember that. He sent Jesus to redeem us, to pay the price that we would never be able to pay for our own sin. Christmas, you see, is about redemption of sinners. And not only did he redeem us, here's the good part, he placed us in his family. We're placed in the family of God that we might receive the adoption as sons That we could cry out, Abba, Father, creator of the universe, the one who put all of this together, the one who sent his son at the right place at the right time. He places us into his family. We become adopted sons and daughters. Why? Because he paid the price for our sin. And when we receive him, we become a part of the family of God. Nothing gives me greater joy than when I'm talking to a lost sinner who repents of their sin and they ask the Lord Jesus to come into their life and then I get to declare to them, welcome to the family of God. Folks, it's a big family. And one day we're going home to be with the Lord And we're going to sit around the dinner table with him and dine with him and him with us. Isn't that going to be awesome? We think Christmas time's fun and it's a wonderful time for family and friends to come together and fellowship. But there's nothing going to be like that day 
And we come together as a family of God, not just First Baptist Church do it, but Christians from all over the world and through all of history, we come together and we sit around the table of God. I know that in our finite minds, we cannot gather the thought or even fathom what that might be like, but I believe it's true because of what God's Word tells us. I and you have been adopted into the family of God. In verse 7 says, I'm no longer a slave, but an heir. In other words, all that God has when I come into the family of God, I have because I'm an heir of God. So when the fullness of time had come, when the time was right, when the time was right, listen, when the time was right, you came to church and you're here because the time <clears throat> is right. The Spirit of God is speaking. With God, nothing is impossible. You say, Brother Allen, I don't believe God could save me. You, you don't know me. If He can save me, friend, He can save you, I promise you. With God, nothing is impossible. I believe with all my heart this morning that there is nobody here by accident. God has orchestrated events in your life. He's brought us to this place, to this crossroads in life, so that every person that's here could hear the gospel one more time. And the time, I tell you, is right. If you're lost this morning, the time is always right for salvation. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And that's the good news of the gospel for you this morning. And I don't know what you're dealing with this morning. It may be this morning that you're already saved. You know Christ is your Savior. But you're dealing with some impossible situations. I believe that if God could come and be born of a virgin, that he can handle anything you're going through. So I don't know what you're going through here today. But maybe this morning you just need to come to God and say, God, you know this impossible situation I have in my life. And Lord, I need you to show me. Show me how to respond. Give me wisdom. Give me guidance. Lord, take care of this impossible situation. God, do what I cannot do or anybody else. Lord, I need your help today. Maybe this morning that's where you are and you need to come. God knows your heart. Whatever your need this morning. In just a moment I'm going to pray. And after I pray, I want to invite you to come this morning. You don't have to come to me. but You can come and pray at this altar freely as God leads you to do so. But if you need Jesus this morning, the time is right. Why not now? Why not come today to Christ? Would you, would you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit of God, I praise you for what you have done for us. Lord, I acknowledge, God, that we're hopeless, hopelessly lost without you. God, uh, thank you for sending Jesus into the world at the right time. And Father, I thank you for sending those who are sitting here today. God, I believe in my heart it's because it was the right time. Lord, there's someone here today that needs to step out in faith and trust Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray for them. God, I pray that you would help them. Lord, speak to their heart. Lord, you know the needs of every person here today. God, in your word, you've declared that there's nothing impossible with you. I pray, Lord, that every person here would hear from heaven. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen and amen. Let's all stand together. As we stand this morning, as we begin to sing, as God speaks to you, would you come? Lost person, you need to come. The time is right. Saved person, what is God dealing with your heart about? This is the time to come. Would you? As we sing, you come, come on.